All right, welcome back. Today we'll be going over more of a pharmacology course. Uh, it's going to be a combination of pharmacology, so your medications that you're bringing, whether that's prescription or over-the-counter, but also a few little small things that you can get at any drugstore that will help build out your medical kit that will definitely be very beneficial in the field. Um, so we'll start out essentially understanding the purpose of building this medical kit and what we're going to be looking for. So ideally, for a lot of the more civilian-sided or military-sided people, think about what's going to be required over a 48-hour period, right? So this is going to be focused on more austere medicine. So that's any time you're going to have a patient that is waiting for transport, whether that's 12 to 48 hours out or even more. So sustaining that patient for a long period of time is going to be pretty important. First off, so what the U.S. military tends to issue out to a lot of medics and frontline forces is what's called a combat pill pack. Um, those are just three medications that are deemed extremely important for any kind of long-term survival. It's a combination of a, of a NSAID or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. So thinking like your normal over-the-counter pain meds like naproxen or Aleve. Then you're going to be looking at an antibiotic, moxifloxacin. It's a general broad-spectrum antibiotic that is extremely beneficial. And then you're also looking at meloxicam, which is just another standard anti-inflammatory drug that helps the body with any kind of uh, inflammation issues. Those are the three realms that we're going to be looking at in terms of long-term survival. Of course, we'll be going into more specific and advanced things depending on your mission set and the threats that are out there. So in terms of if you're going to be out there without any kind of evac, these will help alleviate that gap that you might face. Uh, if you don't have the standard support that maybe a military unit might have. A quick thing to mention is depending on your situation, whether you're able to get some of these more specialized meds, whether you work in EMS or whether you can request them through certain law enforcement agencies that you might be working for or request them through your unit if you're military. A lot of them can be done over the counter or just saving medications that you might be given throughout your daily life whether people in your unit or yourself might be prescribed doxycycline or moxifloxacin for certain medical issues and you maybe you have some left over, it's good to hold on to those things. Looking at anti-diarrheal medication, anti-emetic, so your Zofran or your Dantatron or Promethazine, depending on what you have available. Narcan is a very important one. That's a very common thing you can get over the counter nowadays. It has no adverse side effects, so there's really no limitations on ability to use that in the field or on people that might not require it, but it is a concern. So that's a pretty easy medication to have. You know, when you're out there stocking your medical kit, you might be at, say, Walgreens or Rite Aid or, you know, whatever drugstore you might be going into. There's a few other things you can go ahead and look at. So normal saline, right? You can get sterile water, sterile saline at just about any drugstore, whether that's for contact wash or just standard bottles of irrigation solution. That's always a great thing to be carrying. You can also get blunt tip needles, similar to these, just little syringes, but in your case, you'd be getting blunt tips. So not sharpened, not for injection, but something small and precise that you can use to irrigate wounds, things of that nature. Saran wrap, that's a great thing to be carrying. It can help seal wounds if you might not have, say, a chest seal. You can make do with an occlusive dressing of that nature or just sealing a wound from dirt, grime, and mud. Obviously, it's not an ideal solution, but we we prioritize keeping bacteria and grime out of a wound, more so than ensuring proper ventilation of that wound. Um, you can also reapply as needed, let it vent, let it dry out, and then reapply that, that occlusive dressing after. Super glue is actually a very, very good tool as well. I've used it a, a number of times to quickly seal small avulsions or abrasions. The small cuts that you might have, um, it's not the best solution, but it's a very easy immediate remedy for short-term purposes. So I guess we'll go into more more specialized advanced things that I always have with me, whether that's in my immediate kit uh, that we saw earlier or living in my rucksack. So first off is going to be my IV administration. So that's going to be methods that we'll be uh, utilizing to A, hydrate a patient, B, administer certain medications, whether that's going to be IV or through IV drips um, if it's more long-term. So in my kit, I always have a bundle. This is a collection of a few different things, mostly around the same general idea. I have an NDC, just an extra NDC. Not that it's for IV, but it's essentially a needle, so I wrapped it up in the same place, so it's relatively easy to find. Um, I have about three IVs themselves, the needle and catheter. Ideally, we're looking for an 18-gauge, which you can go 20 gauges, relatively effective as well, depending on your skill level patients, something of that sort. 
But 18 is going to be your best. It's going to be large bore, high flow, especially in emergency. So I always have at least two to three of those, depending. And then I'll also have extras stashed somewhere, either in my rucksack or in a resupply kit that we might be given. Along with that, I have an extension set. So that's going to be that, that lock that goes on the back of the IV, prevents blood from leaking out, but still remains a patent pathway for IVs to be administered. So I also have those bundled into there as well. I also carry two IV flushes. So again, this is normal saline. You know, I can use one to flush an IV when I start and use the remaining for push dose medication or just for wound irrigation. There's a pretty wide range of purposes for those. So it's always good to carry a good number of those. Coband, pretty useful in terms of wrapping wounds, but also, especially if that patient's still moving around and they're still moving through the woods or a more austere environment, wrapping that, that IV heavily to keep it in place is extremely important. We don't want that IV being ripped out in the middle of a movement. So having this is extremely important. Of course, my IV start kit. So that's going to be Tegaderm, your tourniquet, alcohol wipes, and a small bit of tape. That's just everything you need, essentially. This in conjunction with the IV needle and catheter uh, is all you need to start an IV. So this is always good to have as well. Um, it's not 100% necessary. You can start an IV with just the IV itself and none of the other accoutrements in there, but it makes your life easier, makes it a more stable and secure IV itself. Let's carry a pair of forceps. It's good for clamping off IV tubes. Really just a good multi-tool as well. Tape. So I'm always having a few rolls of tape that's in the med pouch itself, but also on my belt. Just, you know, you can never have too much tape. It's good for securing things, but also marking time, dose, medication, stuff like that. And that goes into this Sharpie. Uh, documentation is extremely important. If you're having a movement for, you know, two days, 48 hours, right, between movement of that patient out to some kind of evac, there's not a guarantee that you can remember every intervention that you've done. So making sure you're marking that patient is extremely important. And just taking notes as well if you're taking vitals, which you should be if you're conducting more advanced medicine like this. I also have a couple three mil syringes. That's more of a adjunct to those flushes because once I use those flushes, I can still use the flushes for push dose medications. So about four syringes at a time I'm usually carrying. A couple needles, an 18 gauge and a 21 gauge, 22 gauge, it kind of just depends. One for drawing up medication and then one for IM usage or intramuscular, just depending on what medication I'll be, I'll be pushing. I also have my drip set. Just standard IV tubing. If I have to hang a bag to do more long-term medications, that's required and necessary. And then depending on the space available, I'll either carry a quarter bag or I'll carry a full thousand milliliter IV bag. It just depends on how much space I have. But in a 250 milliliter bag, you can get a pretty a pretty good drip medication going. Not gonna last the longest and it's obviously not gonna offer that much hydration or fluid replacement but it's still pretty good to mix any kind of medication bags. Uh, atropine. So this might be a little bit harder depending on who you are, what you're rolling with. For law enforcement or EMS agency, pretty easy to get. In terms of, in terms of usage on EMS ambulances, you, you'll see this for more cardiac emergencies, but depending if you're a SWAT or critical response, they also give these out for organophosphate poisonings or nerve agent exposure. Um, so that's a pretty good thing to carry, especially nowadays, so many pesticides out there. Also, a lot of people are seeing more non-state actors or rebel groups, terrorist organizations trying to come up with some crude nerve agent. This is a great thing to have because once you're exposed, that's really the only thing that you're going to be able to do to reverse those effects. So that's good to try and get your hands on. You'll find these in a few different ways, either just atropine by itself or in an atropine 2-PAM chloride mix. It, it kind of depends, but if you can get your hands on those, that's a great thing to be carrying. Like I said before, Narcan, especially if you'd be administering any kind of opiate pain medication, I like carry that, any kind of reversal or adverse reaction to an opiate. Just get that out of their system quickly. So let's go into more medications as a whole. So there's a few in here that you can either carry IV, IM, like I carry, or you can find some in auto injectors or PO tablets. Uh, so first off is Epi. So I carry a few ampules of it over an auto injector just because there's a few different uses for it instead of just anaphylaxis but for you guys that are out there you might not have access to some of these vials carrying your EpiPen, obviously it's very uh, very important um, if you're out in the field for a long period of time any kind of anaphylaxis emergency 
epinephrine is going to be really your only lifesaver, but also there's a few different purposes for that as well. So that's something to consider. Odanzatron or Zofran, you can get those relatively easily. They're, they are prescription medication, but not super controlled. Any kind of nausea issues that you might have, they'll prescribe that. Anytime you're prescribed an opiate, that'll go along in conjunction. Also, be carrying dexamethasone. This is a non steroid, so your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory purposes through your meloxicam are beneficial, but sometimes you do need to go for a more steroidal approach, depending on the severity. Also, it will go in conjunction with that epi for anaphylaxis emergencies. Anaphylaxis is going to be pretty common, especially through insects or through foodborne allergies. So being able to counteract that and get those patients going long-term is really important. Sometimes epi is not going to be the, the sole treatment option. It will alleviate those immediate emergencies, but for long-term movements to keep that patient up and in a position where they can keep fighting, sometimes you need a little bit more formal oomph. So that's going to be that dexamethasone and also the usagumedrol, which is another corticosteroid. In conjunction with those for more pain management, I'll carry Tordol or Ketorolax, just a more potent version of naproxen, essentially. It's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Ketorolac and solumedrol or ketorolac and dexamethasone you can do in conjunction and that'll get rid of any nerve pains that you're having from say inflammation in the back or arms. Um, pretty common injuries especially in more austere environments so it's definitely a great thing to be carrying. In terms of fixing very long-term problems that you might have especially if you are treating you know combat wounds whether that's penetrating trauma from a bullet knife broken limb anything like that Sepsis is going to be a very, very uh, scary thing to have out in the field. Um, it can tank a patient very quickly. So I always carry at least two to three grams of recephin. That's going to be another broad spectrum antibiotic. Essentially, that's going to be a one-time dose at the initiation of care. If it is a penetrating wound and we know evac is not going to be for a while, and that'll hold that patient in a pretty stable and secured manner for a while. Um, I can also inject it into my IV bag and have a long-term drip depending on uh, where we'll be, what we'll be doing essentially if we want to be stationary for a while. Having a, a, an ongoing drip with that is very beneficial. These two, so that's going to be our, our reconstitution. So a lot of antibiotics you'll be, you'll find it in a powderized form that needs to be reconstituted. And so depending on the route that I'm using, depends on how I'm going to do that, right? So. If I'm using it in either an IV fashion or through a bag drip, I'll just reconstitute with normal saline, right? So just another one of those IV flushes. That's just getting that medication back into a point where I can inject it and its uh, bio bioavailability is adequate for the patient. Or I can also reconstitute with 1% lidocaine. That's going to be more for IM injection, just a quick shot in the butt, essentially. It is a lot of fluid to be pushing into a muscle, so it can be relatively painful. Also, sometimes antibiotics are, they'll burn quite a bit. So having that lidocaine is more of a quality of life thing. Not quite necessary, but it is beneficial. Another reason I carry, I'll carry a few vials or this one large vial about 1% or 2% xylocaine kind of depends. I can do field sutures if I need. Obviously, it's a more advanced skill, but for a lot of you that have some medical training and have that availability, that's a great thing to have as well. Um, so that's usually the basic stuff that I'll be carrying at all times, especially for you know, out in the field for two to three days or more, being able to sustain that patient for long term is really important for, you know, each and every one of you is going to be a little bit different, right? So if you're law enforcement, you might not have as much access to these medications, but you will most likely have some kind of tactical medic with you. So ensuring that you understand what's going into those kits, what they're carrying, and also working with them to carry what what you might require. So get with your team medics and start getting a, a, an idea of what they're carrying and what you can carry on yourself to make their, their lives easier. For military, you might not really be falling into the, the category of carrying a lot of these, but for your combat medics that are attached to line units, get an idea of what's your more pressing medications versus just having a, your big issued bag full of all kinds of different medications. Pinpoint the, the ones that are gonna be extremely necessary for long-term movements and austere environments. Uh, for civilians, obviously that's a little bit more difficult to get some of these more specialized things, but there's ways to to build up your bags, right? If you have a prescription of antibiotics that you didn't use or you didn't run the full course, something's better than nothing, right? So 
obviously there is that stewardship of antibiotic, but in environments that you might find yourself, whether that's a shit hit the fan kind of kind of day, or you're out in the field for multiple days on a hunting trip, or just doing some kind of training, having these things is is, is a very good idea because you can't always rely on a cellular service or be emergency response to your location. So just keep an eye, keep a keep that in mind when you're building your bags, as this is the the bare minimum that I'll carry. Sometimes this will be buffed up with certain opiates or Xanax, Valium, different things that just are more quality of life things. Um, but that just kind of depends, right? So again, when you're going through your medication tool bag, especially in a drugstore environment where you can start looking at more over-the-counter options, uh, there are a lot of things that can help out. So I, identifying your, your aspirins for cardiac issues, your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so particularly naproxen, is a very good thing. Um, people just think, you know, all pain meds are all pain meds, but the difference between Advil, Tylenol, acetaminophen, they're all different, so make sure you read up on those and identify what's going to be most beneficial for you. I tend to lean more towards the NSAID variety, mostly because we see a lot of muscle strains and overflexation of muscles as a pretty big problem, especially in certain environments, uh, but really pick what's best for you. This is more of a broad broad overlook at what I carry and then you can go from there right what you can get what you can't and what's more specific to you obviously you're carrying your personal medications that you require but start building those those bags and understanding what's necessary right we don't all have to carry fentanyl with us is it a quality of life thing and it's nice to have sure but 99% of you guys can't really get it and it's not going to be as beneficial to you as say carrying an anti-medic right or anti-nausea drug so just you know understanding what's going to be beneficial and what's just going to be a pointless medication that you're really not going to need in the environment that you're at. Um, but there's a, a couple main areas that you need to look at, and that's your prevention of infection. That's going to be your biggest thing, especially in long-term treatments. Pain management, whether that's just Tylenol or Tordol in, in my case. And then you're also looking at any kind of anaphylaxis emergency or uh, any kind of environmental reaction. Um, so that's Poison IVs, insect bites, food allergies, being able to treat those. So your, your corticosteroids and your epinephrine are extremely important. So that's going to be it for the more pharmacology section of this. But stay tuned and we'll be going over a few other things. Circulation, airway, and also like that sepsis and shock treatment, uh, which will all be more technical, technical tasks for you guys to really start training up on. But this is more of an overview of the more specialized things that I'll be carrying outside of those IFACs and just standard personal first aid kits that are usually on my kid or everybody else's kid.